Now, uh, I'll straight away go into my topic that is the anatomy of the optic nerve head and optic disc margin in OCT, decoding the BMO HRW and BMO MRW. I have no financial interest to disclose. Understanding the uh, anatomy of the OCT is important because to understand the GMP program in Spectralis, we need to uh, decode what exactly it is. Now, let's see the role of OCT in glaucoma. So once light falls on the retina, it comes uh, to the rods and cones, through the bipolar cells, into the ganglion cells, and the unmyelinated axons are segregated together, and this is what forms a neuroretinal rim, which is uh, beautifully seen in the spectral domain OCT. So here we have the neuroretinal rim, retinal nerve fiber layer, and the ganglion cell layer. We have to take all these three together to understand what uh, is going on in glaucoma. So now I'll be uh, dealing with the neuroretinal rim, now, to understand that, we need to know what is the clinical disc margin. The major indicator of the optic nerve head health is a neuroretinal rim. But to uh, quantify the neuroretinal rim, we need to see what the disc margin is and what the cup margin is. But is this a true disc margin that we uh, see? If you take this example, if you see the green, uh, green circle is a clinical disc margin. But in OCT, we have something called a Brooks membrane opening. And if you see that, it's totally different from the clinical margin in this particular example. The Brooks membrane opening is um, marked with the help of OCT. So what is this Brooks membrane? Brooks membrane is nothing but it is just a part of the choroid. So, uh, and the Brooks membrane opening is a termination of the Brooks membrane. And this can be consistently detected in the ST OCT imaging. So uh, also we have the internal limiting membrane, which is considered as the uh, margin of the neuroretinal rim. So internal limiting membranes, the Brooks, Brooks membrane, whatever comes in between is a nerve fiber, because we know that the axons can never pass, axons and the blood vessels, it can never cross the Brooks membrane and it must exit beyond its termination. So the true disc margin, according to this study uh, published by Chauhan et al, and as well as the Alexander et al, says that the Brooks membrane, only after the termination of Brooks membrane, the retinal nerve fiber layers can dip into the optic nerve head. So this is a true disc margin that what we are uh, looking at. And it is not clinically and photographically visible. And there is something, uh, now uh, just tell something about the configuration of the border tissue. The border tissue of the Elschnick is a fibrous tissue that is connecting the scleral uh, lip inner scleral, scleral margin to the Brooks membrane opening. So it can have different configuration. When you have the non-oblique border, the, um, uh, it corresponds to each other. So whatever we see clinically is going to be the actual one. But in internal oblique configuration, the border tissue is internally placed than the scleral lip. And in external oblique configuration, we have the border tissue that is coming inside, inside of the scleral lip, no, the Brooks membrane opening. So what we see is actually the clinical disc margin, what we see, will be made of the scleral lip as well as the uh, border tissue of Elschnick. Now, the next term that we have to know is what is the minimum rim width and what is the horizontal limb width. So when we are doing clinical evaluation, what we see here is a scleral uh, lip and uh, this is a cup margin. So the horizontal distance between the disc margin as and the cup margin is what is the horizontal rim width. So uh, we say that the BMO MRW is better than the BMO HRW. Let's see why it is. Because you know the uh, geometric orientation of the axons are not same throughout the same eye. If you take one particular eye, some of the fibers can dip down perpendicular, some can go parallel. So when if we take a BMO HRW and fix that particular position, then uh, you will be uh, overestimating. So uh, one of the example what my mentor Dr. Satin sir says is you just imagine the hair being tied as a, uh, with a, a bun. So uh, if you leave it, you think that the uh, margin is a little thicker. But when you tie it, the tie will be perpendicular to that of the accents. So that will be the exact thickness of the neuroretinal rim that we have. So for this, we have the BMO MRW, which measures the perpendicular distance from the internal limiting membrane. That will be the actual thickness of the nerve fibers there. So it uh, takes uh, care of the geometric orientation. So this is a BMO MRW. So this study by Chauhan et al. has seen that BMO MRW provides a better diagnostic ability to detect early glaucoma 
than the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness or the BMO HRW parameter. And it yields higher diagnostic performance. In Spectralis GMPE program, there is 24 line scans which detects 48 BMO points uh, all through and it is uh, given to us. So this is an animation which shows uh, the internal limiting membrane being marked, the BMO Brooks membrane opening being marked. And it's just a 3D animation to show how exactly this uh, works. And the shortest distance from the BM Brooks membrane opening to the internal limiting membrane is what we are interested in, that is BMO MRW. And uh, the last part, the Brooks membrane in histology versus OCT. If you take the histology of the uh, retinal layers, you can see that the thickness of the Brooks membrane is only two to five micrometer, and the RP is about 14 micrometer, which is about three times thick, uh, thicker than the Brooks membrane. But if you see the OCT picture, you can see that the RP and Brooks membrane looks equally the same thickness, or sometimes even Brooks membrane is a little more brighter than the RP thicker. So why this is, is because of the principle of the OCT, which actually uh, works on the reflectance from the boundaries. In the Brooks membrane, you have five layers, which are all reflect, uh, reflectile, and that's why the thickness looks, it looks more thicker. So uh, with this, I wind up my topic. Um, so, um, acknowledgements to my mentor, Dr. Satin Sir and Prasanna Venkatesh Ramesh, who has been helping me throughout the journey. And uh, next, I call upon Dr. Sachin Sir uh, to present on the pearls and pitfalls of the Brooks membrane detection. So, good morning, everybody. And... Uh, as we continue this same topic, which is really the heart of uh, glaucoma imaging, we will just see how we do the clinical workflow in terms of the BMO, po BMO positioning. Are you sure? Yeah. So, so after knowing how to do it, we will see how practical it is. So uh, this was history. So this is out and this is in. Now, this is very important that individualized marking of the scanning circle is out and automated scanning, automated marking is in and that this itself is the holy grail of imaging. So, BMO is the holy grail of advanced glaucoma imaging is something that everybody should know and BMO is the Brooks membrane opening as we have seen. So, it's not clinically visible, it's BVR like the BVR missiles, you don't see it at all and the machine fires it for you. What it gives you is the repeatability and reproducibility because of which it has made progression assessment a real possibility. It is user independent and it is automated. So all these make it a reliable tool for test, uh, minimizing the test retest variability and this really differentiates the men from the boys in glaucoma imaging. So deviation in clinical disc margin and the BMO is very well known. Why manual is out and automated is in is this because in the manual you cannot see the Brooks membrane opening because of which you cannot mark the clinical disc margin. So this uh, BMO is way out of the clinical margin. This is nearly similar and this is superimposed. This is impossible to detect by the human eye because of which it will also affect the scanning circle in the RNFL analysis. So posterior Im segment imaging in glaucoma consists of the ONH, the RNFL and the macula as rightly pointed out by Swati. The correlation of these three and the one neuron concept is very important and we have to never report each and every structure in isolation which was the mistake committed in the last few decades. Masterly workflow makes the difference between use and abuse is something that we should know. So the study of OCT for glaucoma begins here with this image which is not available with mo most of the machines and which is not seen by most of the ophthalmology consultants. So when we see the BMO overview, we get the segment wise uh, uh, view of the Brooks membrane opening which we can verify. We verify the segmentation, verify the positioning and see that everything is in order before we go to the next step. So go to this. Because it is not available in many devices, this image is not seen in any of the printouts which are described in common le uh, lectures. Now why precision and checklists matter is very important because, that, uh, because 
there are certain things which cannot be missed. One is the rim analysis. Once you've done the ch checking with the point BMO points, you go to the rim. Then see for the local, uh, pro see for the profile. If you see the profile and if you see local dips, you can go again to the same sector and recheck the placement of the Brooks membrane opening. And then second thing is you go to the deviation of the Brooks membrane opening. Now if that is more than 100 microns, you know it is not comparable to the normative database because of which the color coding will go for a toss. So these are very, very uh, fine things and precision matters when you uh, uh, use this for glaucoma image, serious glaucoma imaging. Now you can see the effect of the BMO on NFL scan circle placement. Because you cannot see the center of the BMO, here you may be sometimes right in placing the scanning circle, but here there is no way you can place the scanning circle in the position which is required. Because you just can't identify the BMO. So this is very, very important clinical correlate why BMO uh, centration and automation is very, very important. Now BMO overview, the examination in all centers uh, all sectors uh, and localizing it and classifying it is due diligence without which you should not be proceeding with the uh, analysis of a particular image. So due diligence is mandatory otherwise there is no difference between use and abuse. If you can see here in this image also you have BMO localization that is precise in every sector of the 12 you can see the BMO and uh, the ending precisely very very clearly even clear to the normal human eye. And all the sectors are classified depending upon the normality in terms of red, green, and yellow color coding. Very, very simple, very easy, but mandatory. Knowing that, you have to know that imaging has its own limitations and identification of which is important. Now, if you see this, this image again, the due diligence that you are doing, you will see the image below here, which is has gone for a toss. So irrespective of how good your device is, device, optical devices have their own limitations and you should be absolutely sure of what you are looking at. So in such cases, try to reacquire, alter the image contrast, look for the choroidal wedge and redo the BMO at suspect locations. Now this all is po not possible with most of the machines except the Spectralis and that is what impressed me the most about this machine. I have no financial interest though. But this gives you the cutting edge in ophthalmic diagnostics as far as glaucoma imaging is concerned. Look at this. You have to be beware of disc tilts and torsions. It is an immediate red flag. The moment you see a disc like this, you have to go to the 12 images to sort out whether the BMO has been identified correctly. And as you would realize here, here are the few places where the BMO location visible to your eye and what is marked by the machine is different. So the moment you see this, you have to be sure that or, or you have to be reasonably sure that uh, <coughs> there may be some variation as compared to uh, what, what you would uh, what you should uh, what should should be anticipating clinically. So it's very very important to see these sectors and put them in proper perspective before you go to the normative database and compare. Having said that comparing such disks to normative data database is fraught with danger. You can do it with the RNFL or the macula rather than doing it at the disk margin in such kind of cases. Again, in this case, you see the Brooks membrane opening is lying somewhere else. The clinical uh, disc margin is lying somewhere else. And li rightly here, you can find out that there is no data that is being acquired, no marking that has taken place. So why this is important is in some kind, some kind of optic nerve heads, irrespective of the number of times you do the examination, it is impossible to get the Brooks membrane opening and which is a limitation that you should absolutely understand. Clinical correlation is very important and uh, this is Another uh, example of the uh, uh, of such a case. Now here you can see all the sectors are green. So even though all the sectors are green, doesn't mean that everything is normal because this is just an image. This is not going to give you an answer. This is give, going to help you answer. So just remember that clinical correlation is the most important thing, which we shall uh, see in continuation in the next episode. That is my next talk of the next six minutes. Thank you for your patient hearing. No, you can continue later. Because I've kept that case as the last boogie.
Thank you, Dr. Speta, and uh, good morning to everyone here. I'm going to discuss something about the Brooks membrane opening, mainly the minimum rim width, step-by-step -step approach. Uh, of course, we have this, uh, the Galway Heath grid analysis, how we can do that, and also the Hood report. I am Dr. Satyan Patasaradi from Climate Road. So when you take the OCT, we have uh, two areas of interest. One is the optic disc, and we have the, the ganglion cell layer. These are the two areas of our interest. I'm going to talk only about this, um, the neuroretinal rim, the minimum rim width. Of course, we all need to have a yeah, very systematic approach when we are looking at the OCT. That is the rim, then you have to look at the RNFL, and then we have to look at the GCL map. So I'm just going to discuss only about this uh, uh, minimum rim width here. So one, of course, the, there are about 24 radial scans and uh, there are about 48 uh, Brooks membrane opening points which Dr. Sachin was uh, describing. So let's look at this uh, minimum rim width and what is all this, uh, the Garvey Heath grid analysis is all about. So this is basically a, a six sector, Garvey Heath grid is aligned with the anatomic uh, positioning system, which will be described by Prasanna a little later. So the grid is basically optimized 